Okay, here we go with a video on the topic of adolescence in terms of psychological and social development. Uh, I'm using some new uh, software to do this so that I can do some switches on the screen. So hopefully we can do it without any big glitches. So let's go right to the outline. Okay, and while I'm here, let me get my laser pointer so I can actually point to things on the screen for you. Okay, so in this chapter, we'll be looking at the uh, identity formation. We'll be looking at the adolescents' relationships with their family, their parents, with their peers, friends, and so forth. We'll look at the development of sexuality, as well as dealing with strong feelings such as sadness and anger which may occur in some adolescents. So here we go, let me see if we can get to the next slide. All right, so um, first of all, we're gonna look at identity. So identity might be uh, defined as having a consistent definition of yourself as a unique person in terms of what roles you play in life, uh, as well as what roles you intend to adopt in the future. So maybe for the adolescent, it's a student, uh, athlete or uh, son or daughter and so forth. Uh, maybe in the future they're looking at roles as a parent or uh, as a uh, employer or employee and so forth. Uh, also attitudes. So part of identity is what one's attitudes is of various things and beliefs that one has adopted and made their own. And then aspirations, in other words, future goals, just what do you want to accomplish? So Erickson's first stage of psychosocial development is referred to as identity versus role confusion. I, Erickson saw the adolescent as dealing with this challenge in terms of developing that identity, trying to figure out just who am I what am I going to uh, accomplish here? And in his view then, the adolescent needed to determine what roles, beliefs, attitudes uh, to adopt, what goals to adopt if they were unable to do so as they completed adolescence, then they were in a state of role confusion, simply not knowing who they were and where they're going. So there are a number of identity statuses then that can exemplify where a person is on this journey. Uh, identity achievement occurs when through reflection and searching, the person finally has come to a firm sense of who they are as a unique individual. And all of those things, roles, beliefs, aspirations, and so forth are pretty solid for them. Now, this identity achievement uh, status then produces a cognitive map for that person. Now, cognitive map, uh, well, that's sort of a mental map. Uh, and uh, we have all kinds of mental maps that we uh, use. You know, for example, uh, you have sort of a mental map of where things are on your college campus. And you can picture, well, there's the parking lots and there's uh, the classroom buildings that you might be going to, the library, cafeteria, uh, and so forth. And so you have that mental picture of that. And part of a cognitive map also is that then you can place yourself within that cognitive map. So if you're in the classroom, you kind of know where you are and you know uh, where you have to, uh, how you have to go if you're gonna go somewhere else on campus. You know, same thing happens with identity achievement. So the person uh, who's gotten a sense of identity achievement has looked at past experiences, where they've been, and that helps give them a sense of where they are now. So that orients them in the present, and that gives them an orientation in terms of who they are in terms of their uh, personal history. And then, of course, there are the future plans as well as part of the cognitive map, the goals, the things that the person wants to accomplish. 
And so that gives them a sense of, well, now where am I going to go? And so identity achievement helps that person develop that cognitive map, gives them a sense of direction for the future. Without that, they can be pretty lost. So role confusion, also known as identity diffusion, then means that the person does not have a sense of who they are, where they're going, or maybe doesn't care. So role confusion is exemplified by the person who, as they move on from adolescence, don't really know who they are, uh, what they're going to try to accomplish. So you ask them, well, you know, what do you think you're going to do with your life? And they say, I don't know, whatever. So when in a role uh, situation of role confusion, then this sort of results in the person just drifting along in life as they get into adulthood, uh, having no direction. And that person may be the uh, individual, maybe you know, who is, uh, as they uh, get into their late 20s, maybe still living at home, still hasn't really uh, accomplished much of anything, um, maybe just doing enough to get by, sitting on the sofa playing video games all day, and that's about it. So that would be what happens if role confusion continues into adulthood. Obviously not too desirable. So there are some um, statuses of identity though uh, that are sort of between um, role confusion and identity achievement, such as identity foreclosure. Um, identity foreclosure is when a person prematurely forms their identity without really questioning ideas of others and without analysis of their situation. So they simply adopt roles and values that have been prescribed for them by others. Uh, this is the situation where maybe uh, the adolescent, without really thinking it through, decides to be whatever their parents tell them to become. So maybe their parents tell them, uh, you should become a doctor. Uh, you know, that would be great. You're gonna, and so they simply decide, okay, because I've been told that, uh, that's what I'm gonna do. And the person in identity foreclosure then may look as if they have it all together. It might actually kind of look like identity achievement. The problem though with identity foreclosure is the person is simply taking on the goals, attitudes, beliefs of others without really thinking them through and testing them as to whether they really want those. So the danger with identity foreclosure then is that the person later on begins realizing that those things are truly not their values and goals. And this may precipitate an identity crisis later on. And I'll give you an example. There's one fellow I know, uh, it's a doctor, actually a surgeon, and he was practicing medicine, doing surgery for nearly 20 years. And at one point, all of a sudden, he simply walked out of the operating room right in the middle of operation and said, I'm not doing this anymore. Now, luckily, there was. <laughs> some other doctors there that could finish the procedure. Uh, luckily it was nearly done, but it hit him suddenly that this was not what he had chosen for his life, but what rather others had chosen for him. And that's the danger with identity foreclosure. Now you also might see something that we might call reverse foreclosure. And this is, uh, exemplified the person who says, okay, everybody's telling me I should do this, and my parents are telling me I should do that, and so I'm just going to do the exact opposite. Now, they might think that they're being very independent and defying others, but in fact, even here, they're really allowing others to prescribe what they're going to do and become 
uh, but they're simply doing the opposite. So they're still really being controlled by others. They're not thinking it through what they really want. So identity foreclosure, uh, not the most helpful as one gets into an adulthood later. Another identity status is identity moratorium. So here, the person postpones making identity achievement choices. So maybe they feel they're not ready to make those choices. They don't have enough information or maybe they feel they need more time. So this is a way then that the person can avoid making those decisions, delay making decisions while still moving forward, making progress. So in identity moratorium, the person continues to investigate possible goals, beliefs, attitudes, uh, continues to search for what best suits them, but delays making decisions until they feel ready to do so. So a, a typical example of that might be uh, the adolescent that as they finish high school, they're not really sure what they want to do. So they might mm, sign up for military service, spend a few years doing that while they uh, get a chance to kind of see a bit more of the world and gather more information about what they're really interested in. And then hopefully when they're done with military service, they've kind of got a better sense of who they are and, and what they want to do. Or another example might be uh, the student who's not sure what they really want to do with a college degree and so they simply what take their basic classes that can apply to any degree first giving them some time to again research what vocations they might want to go into as well as um, what major they're going to choose so moratorium gives them a little chance to gather information and make a better choice so we might say in fact moratorium is actually a rather good and adaptive response in cases where people are not really ready to make those decisions. Erickson also identified several arenas of identity achievement. So these are areas that people will consider. One of these would be religious identity. Now today, probably few teenagers actually achieve true uh, religious identity. It's more common probably to see moratorium or foreclosure. So foreclosure being, well, the adolescent simply says, hey, I'm just going to adapt the uh, religious identity that my friends have. And so if they're going to uh, this particular church or adapting those beliefs, religious beliefs, then I'll just go along with them, I'm not really thinking it through. Or we also might see that they adopt whatever their parents' religious identity was. And if their parents were Catholics, uh, then they might say, well, I'm going to adopt that as my religious identity without maybe even knowing very much about that faith. Um, Moratorium is also common amongst uh, teenagers. So they might say, you know, uh, that's just not that important to me to uh, have a solid sense of religious identity. So I, I'll just deal with that later. I'm not really going to uh, go into that right now. Okay. Um, many religious groups expect that uh, young people are not uh, yet at a point of a solid religious identity and that they therefore are going to struggle with various theological questions. So often religious groups will host retreats where, uh, and groups where then adolescents can learn more about that faith, uh, ask questions about it to determine if this is indeed the identity that they want to adopt. Another area of identity would be gender identity. So gender identity in terms of um, will one do, um, adopt what one culture thinks of as normal in terms of uh, sexual orientation, 
um, in terms of um, social norms. So uh, in terms of uh, how one dresses and whether one uh, tries to uh, show what is traditional in terms of gender identity or is a little bit more loose with that. Um, this also involves sexual orientation. Adolescence, often we will find in terms of sexual orientation, really it's a matter of either foreclosure or moratorium. Foreclosure being, well, just looking around, everybody else has this uh, sexual orientation, and so um, never giving it another thought that maybe one sexual orientation might be more uh, consistent with one uh, being different. Uh, also, uh, moratorium in which one uh, simply says, well, I'm really not going to try to make any decisions about that. That may be more common where one's uh, sexual urges are not as common. For example, people who have homosexual urges and so forth, they may simply not try to think about it until later, handle it later. Another arena of identity achievement would be political and ethnic. So in Erickson's day, political parties were kind of a big thing. So in his day, it might be, well, which party are you going to join? Uh, today, it's probably a bit different. And so in terms of politics, is one going to adopt a more conservative or liberal view in politics or more moderate? or what kind of person would I vote for? Uh, that might be the area of identity, politically speaking. Uh, in terms of ethnic identity, here is one that maybe again, a lot of adolescents don't give a lot of thought to. If they're surrounded by people of similar ethnicity, they may simply not think about it, uh, sort of a moratorium sort of situation, or for foreclosure rather. Uh, foreclosure, uh, just adopting uh, what they see around them. Um, on the other hand, if one is in uh, an area where there are many different ethnicities, then one might look at others and try to decide to what extent am I going to hold on to my uh, the same ethnic viewpoints as my ancestors. Um, for example, uh, maybe someone of Mexican-American background uh, might look at it and say, well, am I going to have a quinceanera like my grandmother and my mom had, or am I not going to do that and uh, do something else? Also, there is a special challenge if one uh, has the potential of blending uh, more than one ethnic identity. Uh, for example, the adolescent who maybe has one parent who is black and the other is uh, of Mexican ancestry. And so to what extent do you see yourself as being black or Mexican American? And again, uh, to what extent do you adopt cultural practices that are part of Black culture or Mexican American culture. So that can be uh, very trying in trying to figure that out for adolescents that have a situation like that. We also have the vocational identity. So this would be well, what kind of work do you want to do with your life? That uh, again is probably much more difficult for adolescents today than it was in Erickson's time nearly 100 years ago. Today, there's very little meaningful work available for adolescents. Whatever jobs are available are kind of low wage jobs that really don't go anywhere. And there is a confusing variety of vocations available today. Only a few back in Erickson's day, but thousands of different vocations one can get into. Today, the skills you need to get into a vocation may take many years to attain, whereas often didn't require much education and preparation back in Erickson's day. So 
we're going to say today is it really realistic to expect adolescents to achieve a full sense of vocational identity at age 16 or even at age 19? That might be kind of unrealistic. It might take that adolescent today more time to sort through all of that. Now, in fact, many adolescents do not come to a sense of vocational identity. In fact, not until emerging adulthood for many, often that full sense of vocational identity doesn't come about till age 25 or so. So what we should see is that today, identity formation is more difficult for adolescents than it was in previous generations, more challenging, takes more effort on the part of adolescents, also suggests that we need more support from those around them, parents, uh, teachers, uh, relatives, and so on, to help them to sort through all the choices that are available to them. We therefore also will see that few adolescents today achieve full identity achievement before moving on to emerging adulthood. Now we have a look at the development of relationships with adolescents. So first looking at relationships with adults. So some of the quotes that I thought were beneficial is that research had found the relationships with adults who value trust and connect with adolescents are beneficial. Also, uh, Rhodes and Rothman, as you see on the screen, supportive relationships with non-parent adults is a key asset protect predicting positive youth outcomes. So in addition to good relationships with parents, other supportive non-parent adults can be very beneficial. Again, think of teachers, coaches, uh, high school counselors, um, maybe religious leaders, you name it, uh, those all can be beneficial. But let's now uh, kind of have a look at, well, what about those relationships with the adults at home? relationships between adolescents and their parents. So what we should know is that some conflict at home, commonly known as bickering, is really pretty normal. Now what's that? Bickering is kind of those repeated petty arguments about just, you know, little things. So it's not about major philosophical issues and things like that. It's, you know, um, uh, you, you didn't take out the trash again like you're supposed to, or you leaving your dirty socks around the floor and you're supposed to be picking those up. You know, issues of cleanliness and habits and so forth, or hairstyles and dress and so on, uh, clothing. So those kind of conflicts are pretty normal. Now that said, all out wars uh, between the parent and adolescent uh, ongoing not the norm as we'll see. Now, what really brings on these mm, sort of conflicts that are common in adolescence? Well, uh, maybe you look at the picture there and you can see a typical situation and it looks like, you know, mom is telling that adolescent, hey, I've told you how many thousands of times, I don't want you sitting on the counter, it's not the way we do things. An adolescent is uh, you know, sort of trying to defend their position. So why is this so common? Well, consider that the parent and the adolescent are working out of two different roles. So what role does the parent see them as themselves in, in reference to their adolescent? They see themselves as being the one who is uh, their job is to protect them, uh, to also to train them to behave in such a way that is beneficial. And so that said, the adolescent has a different goal in mind in terms of that relationship. And they are working on becoming more and more independent, which is kind of as it should be. They should be working on that. So now we have conflicting goals. 
the adolescent expressing their independence, the parent trying to um, provide that protective and educational role for the adolescent. And is there any wonder there's going to be some clashes with that? So that said, we find that parents that neglect their role uh, will find that often that is not beneficial. Now, adolescents may feel that they don't need their parents, but nonetheless, an involved parent is protective. Parents also may serve as an emotional presence for their teenager. So if they neglect that, the adolescent feels that the parent was not there for them when they needed it. On the other hand, the parent is available to them, is still pitching uh, in with their parental role, that adolescent knows that they can go to that parent when they really need some help with something. So parents being continuing to be uh, involved is important. Now, when it comes to adolescent rebellion, this is really mostly a social construction. And maybe it started with people like Freud that saw uh, adolescence as a time of uh, upheaval and so forth. Um, and that kind of became a cultural belief. But when the actual research comes out, it says most adolescents do not completely rebel against their parents. In fact, when they interviewed uh, parents and teenagers about their various values and beliefs, they found that the uh, adolescent and their parent tended to agree more than they disagreed when it came to these things. So this is. Uh, more uh, myth than it is reality. That said, yes, the bickering level conflict is very typical. Now, that said, compliance with parental wishes varies by culture. In some cultures, it's going to be expected that uh, the adolescent will sometimes defy the parent's wishes and kind of thought of as sort of normal for once in a while. Uh, in some cultures, they may demand more compliance, and so it is less typical that the adolescent does what they want rather than the parent. It depends on the culture as well. So the relationship between parent and adolescent then uh, is influenced by a number of factors. One, communication. So can they talk openly with one another? Obviously, being able to talk openly results in a better relationship and closer relationship. Also support. So can the adolescent rely on that parent to be there for them when they need it? Can the parent rely on that adolescent to also take care of a few responsibilities uh, as well? And then connectedness. How emotionally connect close are they? Some of that might actually go back to even attachment patterns of early childhood and then how their relationship has developed through childhood. And then finally, the amount of control that is being imposed by the parent. So does the parent encourage autonomy, in other words, self-rule, uh, or does the parent severely limit that autonomy? So that brings up the uh, question of parental monitoring. Parental monitoring is that the parent is aware of what the adolescent is doing, where they are, and so on. So when is this beneficial? When is it harmful? Well, one thing we can say is that if parental monitoring is motivated by other than concern for the adolescent's welfare, it is less likely to be beneficial if it is motivated by simply uh, needs for control or fear. Uh, it may not be as beneficial as if it's motivated by affection. When is it beneficial? Well, when it's at a reasonable level. And you say, well, what's a reasonable level? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a tough one because some adolescents require more monitoring than others. If they have difficulty making good decisions, they might require more monitoring. 
uh, if they have uh, shown good decision-making ability, maybe less monitoring is more appropriate. Also, there are mm, situations where parental monitoring can be harmful. And one example might be the adolescent who has shown reasonably good decision-making abilities, and yet the parent is heavily monitoring their activity. So the parent that calls every 15 minutes to ask where they are, who's there, and what they're doing uh, when the adolescent is out just doing normal things, that may be uh, problematic. So, in fact, this may uh, produce a great deal of embarrassment for the adolescent. It may signal to the adolescent that the parent does not trust them, even though they've done everything to earn their trust. And it also uh, may be harmful in that the adolescent then may be motivated to devise ways to get around that monitoring. And so uh, I think I have one person that said, overly strict parents raise sneaky kids. <laughs> And so, yeah, too much of that can be bad, but it sort of depends on the adolescent. And I think here what you see is, yes, parenting adolescents is not a simple and easy task. A lot of times there are difficult decisions that need to be made. We also may see emotional dependency uh, between parents and adolescents. And too much parental helpfulness can lead to too much dependency in the adolescent or the adolescent does not become uh, more independent. An example, they found that teen mothers whose parents completely took over the uh, care of the uh, baby, they found that their identity formation uh, was uh, sort of stunted as a result. Whereas uh, mothers who, uh, the parents did not take over the care of the baby. Their identity formation was more advanced. So we can do too much of that. Um, by the way, uh, there is a tendency to be more protective of girls and also uh, in ethnic minorities, maybe a tendency to produce more parental dependency, uh, but that varies by group. Now, looking at the ongoing influence of parents, parental influence may be evident ongoing even when teens seem defiant or indifferent. And I found this personally when my kids were adolescents. Uh, a lot of times I would uh, tell them they need to make certain changes, uh, maybe not do certain things and so on. And I thought it was just going in one ear and out the other until the, I actually heard them telling their friends the very same things that I had told them, I realized that actually they were <laughs> getting some of that. So effective parenting during teen years may be protective from, for adolescents for many problems. So again, parents need to be involved and not simply check out when their adolescent seems not to be listening. Next, let's look to peer relationships, relationships by, with the adolescent and others of their own age group. So what we see in adolescents is um, the formation of cliques, particularly early in adolescence, first few years, cliques being groups of adolescents who are very close friends, very loyal to one another, but exclude outsiders. Usually these are maybe, you know, uh, three, four, five, Adolescents, usually not more than that. We also see that these cliques can be very important influence on the adolescent. Uh, whatever is popular within that clique that they're a part of, that adolescent may feel pressure to adopt that behavior, attitude, what have you. We also have uh, what we might call the crowd. That's larger group, has something in common. It's not necessarily that each of the people in that crowd knows each other, 
or has any close relationship with others. So that might be what we used to have, like the jocks and skaters and nerds and things like that. Uh, there's probably a whole bunch of different newer groups as well. Um, the desire to be part of a particular crowd then might have a strong influence on the adolescent, might guide their decisions as to what clothing uh, they choose, music they listen to, uh, what drugs they might use, and so on, all in an effort to be part of, thought of as being part of that crowd. So we also see the phenomenon of peer facilitation. To facilitate is to make something easier. Peer facilitation, one's peers make certain behaviors easier to uh, engage in. So other adolescents might encourage or suggest activities and behaviors that influence then the adolescent. Peer facilitation can be constructive or destructive. So for example, if all the other uh, friends that that adolescent have are going to get together and study for an exam, uh, that may make it easier for that adolescent to join in studying. That's constructive peer facilitation. On the other hand, if they're all getting together to go out and steal hubcaps, uh, they still have hubcaps. Um, anyways, um, that might be destructive. So sometimes peer facilitation involves risk taking. Uh, Gardner and Steinberg did a study in which adolescents uh, would drive a vehicle, vehicle sim simulator. And what they found is adolescents, when there was an audience of other adolescents, were more likely to take risks engage in risky driving behaviors when other adolescents were present. An example of peer facilitation. Um, maybe that's why uh, when adolescents first can get their driver's license, now they uh, limit it to what not other adolescents in the car at first until they get a bit older. Peer facilitation also is often indirect. Uh, for example, um, you might have a situation where um, maybe an adolescent goes to a party and there's people who are smoking marijuana and they're passing around a joint and nobody says to them, hey, you have to do this to be part of the group, uh, but it comes to them, everybody else is doing it. And so that facilitates them experimenting with it. Sometimes an adolescent selections of friends are actually calculated to excuse certain behaviors, to facilitate certain behaviors. Now, I know none of you would ever do that, but uh, you know, uh, as an example, maybe the adolescent who wants to stay out late at night They'll develop a relationship, uh, friends who stay out late, and then when they go out with them, uh, then they can say when they come in late, and the parent says, why are you coming in so late? They can say, oh, well, you know, those uh, people I went with, you know, they didn't want to come home, and so I didn't have any choice. Notice facilitates the behavior of staying out late, excuses it, uh, at least in their mind. So peer pressure is actual social pressure to conform with what others are doing, other peers. Again, this can be a positive or negative influence. So uh, for example, uh, maybe we have a situation where one adolescent is disrupting class. If all the other students give them a dirty look, like, come on, stop it, or say, hey, come on, we're trying to learn something, uh, that peer pressure can be positive in sort of shutting down that misbehavior. Now, on the other hand, peer pressure can obviously be a negative influence and uh, can also um, Oh, here, okay, all right. Extreme example of negative peer pressure might be deviance training. 
So this is when one adolescent shows others how to uh, rebel against authority or against uh, social norms, laws, and so forth. An example might be uh, the adolescent who shows the other kids how to steal things in the convenience store and engage in shoplifting or how to obtain uh, alcohol before they're of age. This would be deviance trading. Uh, obviously uh, destructive. In some cases, popular kids may be imitated by less popular kids and so sort of an indirect sort of peer pressure. If you want to be popular, do those destructive things that some popular kids might be doing. So a uh, wide variety of ways that this functions. And looking at peer selection, choosing who it, one's going to have as friends and who one wants to associate with, like other age groups, adolescents tend to choose people who share their interests, share their values. Adolescents, however, may simply abandon friends that change their interests or values and no longer share them. And uh, so they might just dump those friends that are now different from them. In some cases, selecting associates may involve tests of potential suitability and loyalty. And here, think of gang initiations where the uh, person desiring to join that gang might have to commit some crime in order to be uh, part of that group. And so uh, not always a good thing. Most adolescents today have friends of both sexes and often they depend on friends of the other sex to give them a different perspective on things that they would get from friends of their own sex. Interestingly, friends of the other sex, uh, those friendships tend to last longer than romantic relationships. When it comes to relationships, immigrant youth often end up being sort of model youth. You know, their family may tell them, you know, we didn't come here for, uh, for nothing. You have to make something of yourself and you have to present a positive picture of our cultural group to others because you represent us. In addition, Im immigrant youth may have stresses on them as they may sort of be family heroes. Uh, that adolescent may be the only one in the family proficient in English, so whenever something needs to be done involving speaking English, they're called upon to take care of it. So often they have a lot of responsibility on their shoulders. So they often also may face some dilemmas, how to integrate the traditions of their cultures with what their peers are doing. As an example, uh, maybe we have a uh, adolescent from a cultural group where girls do not cut their hair, but all the all their friends are getting short haircuts. So what do you do? You want to fit in, but you've got that cultural norm. And so how do you deal with that conflict between those two things? This is where friends of the same ethnic background really are highly valued. And so those others from the same ethnic group may be a sounding board where one can go and say, hey, you know, what are you gonna do with that? Or how have you worked that out? And so often very important that they have uh, friends from their own ethnic group. Now let's have a look at the development of romantic relationships in adolescence. So researchers years ago, identified a certain pattern of interactions that typically was followed by uh, children and adolescents as they were growing up. And that's shown here on your screen. So traditionally, you find groups of friends made up of boys or girls hanging out together, uh, not mixing with those of the other sex. And then as kids got a little bit older, you would have groups of boys and girls um, 
interacting in public. So you got a group of boys encountering a group of, group of girls, uh, maybe at uh, uh, a place where they uh, have games or something. And uh, so they interact, those groups interact for a while, and then the boys go their separate ways, the girls go their separate ways. Then as kids got a bit older, they found small mixed sex groups uh, being formed. So groups that there were both boys and girls, uh, that part of that group that would hang out together. And then finally, uh, as kids got uh, then more uh, mature, then you might have the formation of couples interacting privately. Um, so that was kind of the progression that was typical years ago. Now, if I was to ask you, do kids typically follow this progression? You're probably gonna say, well, yes and no. Maybe for some kids that is the way it goes, but for a lot of kids, um, you might see them sort of skipping over some of these steps, if you will. Uh, and if you don't believe that, you know, just go by any middle school as they're letting out school and see uh, guys and girls hanging on each other and stuff like that. So mm, is that good that we have some adolescents that are simply jumping from childhood into forming romantic relationships very early in adolescence? Maybe not. So here's a couple reasons. If one skips over some of these steps of development, what have you missed? Has anything important been missed? Well, think about it. If you've skipped over this first step, hanging out with people of the same sex, um, you may have missed out on just how do you uh, interact effectively with people of your own sex. Um, if you have skipped the second step, step here, well, how do you interact with people of the other sex that uh, are not romantic partners uh, that you just engage with as acquaintances or friends. So skipping simply to developing romantic relationships means there are some skills that the adolescent has not developed. In addition, when we see very early and exclusive romances in adolescence, that may indicate social deficits, social skills that they haven't developed, like how to hang out with people of your own uh, sex, or how to simply be friends with others, or it may indicate maybe some difficulties, for example, uh, that adolescent may substitute that romantic relationship for affection that they should receive from their parents, family at home. So uh, we have to be a little cautious where we see very young adolescents uh, engaging in these exclusive romantic relationships. Now that said, the first real romantic relationships for most people are gonna incur when they're getting into high school. So a lot of people look at those relationships and they say, oh, well, it's all about physical intimacy and sex and all that sort of thing. Or is it maybe though more about companionship? In fact, the research seems to suggest that companionship is a very strong motivator of romantic relationships at that age. These romantic relationships then are something that the adolescent now has to learn how to manage. So they may experience their first breakup with their romantic partner. How, how do you handle that? They have to learn that. Um, they might experience a crush on some individual, then the other individual not interested in a romantic relationship. How do you deal with that, someone that rejects you? So learning experiences. That romantic partner also may provide a third support network for that adolescent. How so? Well, think about it. What's the adolescent's usually first support network? It's probably going to be what? Their family, their parents. Second support network for most adolescents is gonna be their friends. And then that romantic partner might be sort of the third leg of the stool uh, that gives them support in their day-to-day -day, uh, activity and difficulties they might run into. So all in all, 
not a bad thing, okay? Provides learning opportunities and support for adolescents. Now, looking a little closer at the development of sexuality, uh, we'll look at, uh, for example, uh, kind of putting that together with uh, friendships, romantic relationships, uh, the adolescent who experiences homosexual uh, feelings and so forth, uh, orientation, then this may complicate formation of friendships, romantic relationships. So some adolescents having these feelings will deny that, try to uh, feel, try to mm, sort of ignore them, or they may delay acting on those feelings, thinking to do that later. Some adolescents also may experiment with homosexual relationships, but eventually report other sex orientation. So there's a lot of shifting around, or some shifting around at least, of uh, um, sexual orientation at this point. But again, for that adolescent that uh, does have that uh, homosexual orientation, often they're hesitant to let other people know until later. When it comes to learning about sex, uh, parents and society obviously is uh, has an interest in adolescents developing healthy attitudes towards sex and having uh, good information. However, in many cases, the information that adolescents have is faulty, as many surveys have indicated. So, where do most adolescents get their information about sex? Many of them get information from their peers, what they hear from their peers. And their behaviors also may be strongly influenced by the example of their peers. So we have this uh, phenomenon of click conformity, that the adolescent uh, conforms to what others in their click do. do, do. So um, in that click, if uh, the other Adolescents are sexually active. That puts pressure on that adolescent to also be sexually active. If they abstain from sexual activity uh, in that particular clip, that also provides then uh, motivation to uh, remain not active as well. So there have been a number of attempts to then use uh, peer pressure to influence sexual activity of adolescents like uh, one approach where adolescents would take a virginity pledge along with a lot of other adolescents. Uh, it sounds like it might be a good idea having the adolescent, uh, helping the adolescent to uh, hold off sexual activity until later. But what they found is those that took the virginity pledge, um, there were some sort of negative side effects. It seemed to uh, promote a greater likelihood of marrying early on, uh, less use of contraception if one does become sexually active, and also earlier parenting, parenthood uh, as well. So maybe that's not the best approach to influence adolescent sexual behavior. Now, parents are also uh, an important influence on the development of sexuality. However, it turns out that often parents are not aware of the needs of that adolescent in terms of uh, knowledge, in terms of sexual uh, knowledge. Um, they may underestimate the child's needs. So uh, the parent may feel that that child doesn't need information until they're somewhat older, when in fact that adolescent may be experiencing pressure to engage in sexual activity already at that point in time. They also found that in many cases, uh, the parent was not aware that their sexual, that their adolescent was sexually active. They uh, thought they were not, when in fact the adolescent was. So parents can be good sources of information for adolescents. They found that adolescents that discussed sex with their parents took more 
uh, took fewer risks, uh, engaged in less sexually risky behavior. They also were more resistant to pressure to have sex. Uh, they believed that their parents provided good information. So uh, actually suggesting that they were listening as well. Now that said, honest and open communication between adolescents and parents regarding sexuality, maybe not as common as it should be. And you think of why is that? Well, a lot of times uh, parents may simply um, think that that conversation is not necessary. The adolescent will pick up that information on their own. Uh, a lot of times the information they get from their friends or the internet may be inaccurate. Uh, the parent also may feel uncomfortable talking about that topic. Oh, by the way, at what age do you suppose parents ought to discuss sex with their uh, children? What age? When I ask that question in class, you know, some people will say, oh, I don't know, maybe when they get into middle school, maybe when they reach uh, age 12, and so on. Mm, I'm going to suggest to you that maybe parents uh, begin that process when the child is fairly young, when the child has uh, questions regarding sexuality uh, that at a fairly young age, the parent gives the child some information. Uh, now, what the child is uh, actually prepared for and needs at that age. So, you know, the six-year-old that notices that male and female dogs are different, uh, we can give them an explanation about that, uh, that they can understand at their level without providing every detail about sexuality. Uh, that six-year-old doesn't need to know how to put on a condom or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, just give them a little information about it at a level that they can uh, process. And then as more questions come up, as the child gets older, the parent can provide more information little by little. So this prevents what many parents dread, which is having that big talk about sex rather one is giving that information little by little as the child becomes able to process that. Um, also, if parents begin that process early on, uh, they can also instill uh, values regarding uh, sexual behavior uh, at a point where the child can internalize them before uh, other people have greater influence on them. So my suggestion, parents do this as an ongoing process as the child matures and that eliminates that uh, uncomfortable big conversation. Um, okay, so let's go then to um, sex education in school. So um, there is, um, has been an attempt to provide some sex education in school and a variety of programs. For the most part, those programs are going to provide simple um, information about the biological aspects of uh, sex, sexuality. Um, that said, there have been attempts also to influence behavior and values. So in some schools, they tried abstinence-only programs. And so uh, what they drilled into the students is do not uh, say no or just say no. Uh, what they found is abstinence-only programs had little effect on sexual behavior of adolescents. In one program used here in Texas, some parts of Texas, uh, what the emphasis was is engaging in safe sexual practices and delaying sexual activity. This program seemed to be more effective. They found adolescents engaging in less sexual activity and using uh, condoms and other protective sort of procedures more often uh, if they were sexually active. So you say, well, why would that be more effective? Why wouldn't 
simply say no be more effective? Uh, I think there's a couple reasons. One is the program that encourages safe sex and delaying. Um, the adolescent looks at that and says, you know what, uh, they're talking about you know, how to avoid risky sexual behavior. They're treating me more like an adult. Maybe I'll actually stop and listen to them. And then they stay tuned to listen to also why it might be beneficial to wait till later to become sexually active. So I think that's one of the reasons that tends to be more effective. So when it comes to the sexual behavior of adolescents, not all adolescents are sexually active. The rates vary from nation to nation. Things connected with that also. Uh, we have seen teen births decrease dramatically in every nation. Uh, the use of uh, protective measures also has increased. Abortion rates are down as well. Uh, in fact, only half of what they were in the 1970s amongst adolescents. So uh, there's been actual improvement in these areas. Now that said, here in the US, we do have a higher teen birth rate and less contraceptive use amongst sexually active adolescents than other developed nations. We do have room for improvement here in the US when it comes to that. So let's have a look then about the effects of uh, having sex too soon before one is really um, uh, prepared for that. So first of all, we have to recognize that uh, kids are going through puberty earlier than kids used to. And there are weaker social taboos uh, regarding being sexually active. So this then, means that adolescents are going to be dealing with some strong pressures from their biology as well as uh, social pressures to become sexually active at an early age. That said, early sexual experiences they found correlated with depression, drug use. Now, that's a correlation. So we don't know if that's cause and effect, cause, effect, third factor. It might be that early sexual experience uh, actually does lead to depression, for example. Uh, the adolescent finding that it was not as uh, rosy as they might have thought or not uh, able to uh, help them as much as they thought. Um, on the other hand, it might be that it's an effect. So in fact, uh, the adolescent being depressed might feel that maybe engaging in sexual activity might uh, change their mood. Or it could be some third factor. In fact, maybe uh, being in a situation where you're rejected by others, uh, you might, uh, that might uh, actually uh, increase your likelihood to be depressed as well as to um, engage in sexual activity as well. So, uh, we don't know exactly, it may be all three of those things, but we do know there is a correlation. Now, if that early sexual behavior also results in pregnancy, this can be difficult for that adolescent. Raising kids today is more complex and ex expensive than it was generations ago. Our culture is just not set up for raising children uh, at an early age. Most teen mothers today do not have husbands who will stick around to help out with the child. Grandma today is often too busy, maybe working and so forth to help with caregiving. And so our culture is just not geared for teen childbearing. Early sexual activity also might expose an adolescent to sexually transmitted infections these being more common and more dangerous today. Teenage pregnancy today is uh, occurring at only half the rate that it did in 1960. Adolescents are using more contraception. Uh, there are fewer abortions, fewer births uh, per capita in adolescents today. That said, Teen maternal birth rates 
are high in undeveloped nations. So those parts of the world, uh, high numbers of adolescents deal with that. Rates of birth complications for youngest girls are much higher than those that are older than 15. So the adolescent who gives birth to a child before age 15, more likely to have birth complications than if they uh, did age 16 and up. Notice adolescents, uh, when they pass age 15, between 15 and 19, uh, actually have fewer com birth complications than women who are over age 35. So one of our big concerns about teen pregnancy is it can have some very significant impacts on both the mother and the child. And in all of these areas, um, we find that health outcomes for both mother and child tend to be less good. Uh, with uh, teen pregnancies. Also, the uh, girl who gives birth as a teenager less likely to complete their education. Um, we find that attachment patterns between mother and child tends to be more disturbed, uh, more likely disturbed than uh, if there is a uh, mother is somewhat older. And both mother and child increase risk for psychological and social problems, psychological problems like depression, uh, social problems uh, such as um, uh, being taken advantage by others. In terms of sexually transmitted infections, uh, we have a long list of them now. Sexually active teenagers have a higher incidence of sexually transmitted infections than other age groups. Okay, so those who are sexually active, higher incidence. Younger adolescents are also more vulnerable to contract those infections when exposed to them. Uh, their bodies not being as mature, don't have the defenses uh, to as great an extent as if they were a bit older. Often adolescents who contract STIs fail to get prompt treatment. They may fear that their parents are going to find out if they go for uh, treatment to get tested for that. Uh, they may not uh, know the symptoms of that, so they don't go for treatment. Or they may uh, simply not have the means to get to where they can be tested and treated. Also, adolescents are less likely to alert sexual partners if they have contracted a sexually transmitted infection, uh, and that increases the transmission of it from one person to another. So many of these infections have no immediate symptoms, but serious consequences. Uh, there are a few of these with which immunization is uh, available. Obviously, encouraging that immunization would be uh, a good idea. Adolescents don't always ex, uh, don't always uh, avoid sexual activity, so it's reasonable uh, to immunize them where that's possible. So now we get to a topic that's not very fun, but that we need to talk about, and that's child sexual abuse. So legally speaking, that would be any sexual activity between a juvenile an adult. Um, this could take a wide variety of forms. Now, we usually we think of uh, child sexual abuse as involving uh, some, um, you know, uh, male to female, uh, male perpetrator, but in fact, uh, the perpetrator may be female, may be the same sex as the person or other sex. Uh, this is a worldwide problem when we look at it. Uh, that would include things like what forced marriages of very young children, uh, genital surgeries that are performed uh, against the will of children, or children being forced into prostitution. Um, you say, well, most of this, uh, that's somewhere else in the world, but yeah, here in the U.S., 
there are also some of these things going on as well. So what we find is child sexual abuse is destructive to all areas of development. Every adolescent problem that you can think of becomes more common in teen victims of sexual abuse. What you're gonna see from the um, statistics I'm gonna show you here is that um, this type of abuse is most common in early adolescence and is more common in girls, but both sexes and adolescents of all ages uh, can be victims of this type of abuse. So let's see, here's where I'm gonna to go to a different screen and show you some statistics from that website that you see here. And so let me see here, uh, there it is. It should be on your screen now, I hope. So notice that, uh, go to the top here. Uh, yeah, every nine minutes uh, we have um, this sort of thing being reported and uh, every nine minutes, I should say, uh, Child Protective Services substantiates, finds evidence uh, for sexual abuse. When we look at this, uh, notice that 66% of the victims are between age 12 and 17. Okay, so that is the age group that is uh, particularly high, hard hit from that. Although, 34% of them also ate under age 12. Have a look at this. One in nine uh, girls and one in 53 boys experience sexual abuse or sexual assault at the hands of an adult. 82% of victims being female. Um, also notice females age 16 to 19 four times more likely than general population to be victim of rape, attempted rape or sexual assault. Um, in terms of some of the effects of this, notice um, victims' mental health can be long lasting. Mm, comparing victims with non-victims, mm, four times more likely to develop drug abuse, uh, experience PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder as adult, uh, three times more likely to experience major depression as an adult as well. So pretty significant effects, and we'll talk about some of the others as well in a minute. Also notice, here's something about the perpetrators of child sexual abuse. 93% of these perpetrators are actually known to the victim. So only in 7% of cases, did it turn out that that uh, perpetrator was a stranger? Notice 59% some acquaintance in 34% of cases an actual family member. So whereas we might think we're protecting, have to protect people against strangers, in fact, it's the acquaintance and family members that actually tend to be more frequently the perpetrator. Let's see what else do we have. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let me go back to our outline. And let's see. Oh, yeah, there we are. Okay, so some of the other well documented effects of sexual abuse on victims um, a loss of self worth, loss of self esteem. So the person sees himself as being now uh, less valuable and thinks of themselves less highly. It's kind of a tendency almost to blame themselves in some cases. Also, the victim may be isolated. They may find that uh, the perpetrator uh, threatens them uh, to, uh, to not interact with others, or it may be that that person simply does not uh, have the uh, motivation to interact with others the victim may find themselves unable to trust others, even others who should be safe individuals. This also may um, produce problems in relationships and developing close relationships with others, including romantic relationships later on. Sexual abuse also may result in a distorted view of sexuality. So here's a question for you. 
is most sexual abuse about sex? Question is no, most of the time it's about power and having power over someone else. So if one experiences that as a child, one may develop the idea that sex is all about uh, having power over other people. And so therefore, there's also a greater likelihood that person will turn around and engage in that sort of behavior, uh, having that view of sexuality. Uh, so we sign depression, more likely PTSD, as we mentioned, higher vulnerability to many other problems, drug abuse, eating disorders, pregnancy, suicide, all of those. So obviously uh, many serious implications. So what can we do to uh, reduce the number of children who experience child sexual abuse? One of the things that we can do is to make sure that we report it if we suspect that child sexual abuse is going on. Um, you already know from earlier in the course that in Texas, all of us are required by law to report any suspected abuse. There are many ways you can do that. If the abuse is occurring right now, you need to know three numbers. That is 911 if it's occurring right now. And have them come document what's going on, stop what's going on, and document it. Um, if it has occurred or we suspect it, then we may call Child Protective Services, local police department, uh, or we might report it through the Texas Abuse Hotline. Simply Google Texas Abuse Hotline, and we can do that by phone or by uh, online. Uh, so there's just no excuse for not reporting this. Child's life, um, even for the rest of their life, might be influenced by us making sure that someone uh, intervenes. A second thing that we might also mention in terms of preventing child sexual abuse is giving children information, educating them, and educating people just in general. So kids should know that. Uh, certain uh, actions, touching, being touched by uh, others is inappropriate, and they should know that they can come to an adult and report that if that's occurring or someone tries to do that, and that they will be supported in that being followed up. Uh, we also need to, you know, just educate the public about, you know, how this tends to happen. A lot of people think it's uh, primarily strangers, when in fact it's you know, acquaintances and uh, family members that tend to be more the case. So educating the public as well is important. So now we go to dealing with strong feelings of sadness and anger, which some adolescents experience. And having said that, we should recognize most adolescents have a relatively enjoyable adolescence. Um, there may be times when they have some difficulties emotionally, but most of them get through it without any serious problems. But if you do have some serious problems, that's a significant number, and so we need to consider that. Now, in fact, when difficulties handling strong emotional feelings occur, often there is a comorbidity. In other words, there's more than just that going on. There is another disorder involved or there are uh, other problems that are contributing to the emotional difficulties. So in looking at uh, strong uh, feelings of sadness, in fact, uh, clinical depression, major depressive disorder, uh, this becomes more common in adolescence than it is in childhood. So what do we have? Uh, this occurs, the person two weeks or more has felt, felt sad, hopeless, or has lost interest in activities that would normally be pleasurable. Two weeks or more uh, for uh, much of the day. In addition to that, uh, accompanied by an, any number of other symptoms like uh, feelings of um, worthlessness, thoughts of suicide, 
or self-harm, uh, difficulties sleeping, too much, too little, uh, changes in appetite, uh, fatigue, lethargy, um, agitation, um, the lack of energy, difficulty making decisions, so forth. Um, so uh, we see that pattern, uh, major depressive disorder, clinical depression may be diagnosed. So I say, well, what contributes to the develop a, uh, development of this? Why more of this when you get into adolescence? Well, all of the things that influence this lifelong, as well as some things uh, significant uh, in adolescence. For one, some people just have a greater genetic vulnerability to this. Uh, textbook says depressed mother in early childhood. Um, I say, well, potentially uh, that may produce some relationship problems that are problematic later. Higher levels of stress. This is one uh, that may help account for why we see more of this in adolescence than childhood. Adolescents have more stress to deal with. Also, social problems. Uh, the adolescent that uh, is rejected by others or bullied or lacks friends or maybe is having difficulty in their relationship with their parents, so on and so forth, uh, as well as attribution style. Attribution style being just how do you explain what's going on in your life? Um, so when having difficulties, certain attributions tend to get people de depressed. When people look at their situation, something bad is happening, and they see that as being uh, personal, that they themselves are to blame. So when you blame yourself, you're more likely to get depressed when you say, you know, it's not my fault, it's some situation out there, it's or someone else's fault. Um, also, if one uh, makes the attribution that the problem is permanent, so the adolescent that loses their best friend says to themselves, I'll never have a good friend again. You know, that's gonna more likely get them depressed than if they say, ah, you know, it's temporary, I'll find new friends. And thirdly, if one sees the problem as being pervasive, in other words, that everything in life is ruined, again, more likely to get depressed. So in this situation, maybe adolescent uh, having difficulty in school, if they see that this means their entire life is ruined, <laughs> they're gonna more likely get depressed than if they say, ah, but that's just one area of my life. I still have my friends and my family and you know, I can succeed in athletics and that sort of thing, and they're gonna do better. So attribution is really significant. And then finally, rumination. So rumination is, um, well, uh, where you, what? keep bringing up your problems, you keep dwelling on them and thinking, overthinking problems, okay? Now, what we see is that uh, in adolescents, rates of depression about 15%, but the rates of girls twice that of boys. In fact, rumination may be one of the reasons how we deal with difficulties uh, as males or females uh, contributes to that. So um, think about it. If you're a boy and you're having troubles, uh, what do you do? Most teenage boys, uh, they'll sort of what? Act out, you know? So they'll maybe what? Um, they'll get in a fight, drive recklessly. Maybe they'll get drunk. Um, they'll sort of act out that uh, problem, okay? On the other hand, what do girls tend to do? Uh, girls tend to keep the problem in more. Maybe they'll discuss the problem with their friends, but even then, what are they dwelling on the problem? So that rumination that tends to be more typical with girls uh, makes them more vulnerable to depression generally than boys. Boys have more problems getting in trouble with the law and so on when you're dealing with uh, feelings of sadness or anger. So that brings us to discussion of suicide. And so what we should know is that suicidal ideation, thinking about suicide is actually relatively common in, in adolescents. In one survey, they found that 19% of girls admitted that they had thought about killing themselves within the past year. 
Now that said, completed suicides are actually less likely amongst adolescents than the adult population. That said, any suicide is tragic, especially when you're looking at an adolescent who has a whole life in front of them. One of the things that accounts for the differences in number of completed suicides, adolescents versus adults, would be what we call parasuicide. Parasuicide is anything that looks like a suicide attempt, whether it was actually intentionally meant uh, in the person's life or not. What we see in adolescents is a higher rate of um, what looks like suicide attempts that are actually cries for help uh, or the results of uh, confusion or um, sort of uh, impulsivity, okay? So what we also know is there are some factors that influence the outcomes of parasuicide. So what we find is amongst adolescents, uh, girls engage in more suicide attempts or parasuicides than boys. On the other hand, the adolescent boy is more likely to die by suicide than a girl. You say, why is that? Okay, a uh, couple reasons. Um, first of all, um, what we find is that boys tend to use more lethal methods, attempted suicide, so you know, guns, ropes, things like that. Uh, whereas girls tend to use methods that, in fact, the person might be revived. They might, uh, you know, take pills or uh, maybe um, they might, um, sorry, I'm thinking about getting some coffee here. <laughs> sorry. Uh, they might take pills or they might, you know, slash their wrists. In that case, there is some potential of uh, reviving them and that sort of thing. So that's one of the reasons that you see that difference. Uh, males, females there. Um, one of the things you also encounter with uh, adolescents more commonly than other age groups would be cluster suicides. So one adolescent takes life and others of a similar group, more uh, higher risk of doing that. Uh, there was a situation where an honor student uh, a few years ago committed suicide. Several honor, other honor students followed suit uh, shortly thereafter. So what can be done for adolescents that are experiencing uh, suicidal urges? Um, well, there are a couple things that seem to be beneficial. One is cognitive behavioral therapy. So therapy that helps the adolescent uh, change how they're thinking about things, the cognition, as well as engage in new and more beneficial behaviors. Sometimes that involves uh, developing uh, better relationships with others and so forth. Uh, that can be very helpful. In some cases, medication may be beneficial. Uh, sometimes there is underlying suicide or underlying depression, and medication that can help relieve the depression can be beneficial. However, there's one thing we should know, and that the same medication that might relieve depression in some adolescents actually increases suicidal thoughts. So the adolescent on that medication needs to be monitored carefully. What about warning signs of suicide amongst adolescents? Well, what we find is very frequently, frequently that adolescent has actually uh, provided some warning signs that adolescent may um, you might see a sudden change in personality. Maybe they've been sad for a while and suddenly they're very happy. They may have uh, been depressed and now that they've made the decision to do away with themselves, they uh, become more uh, positive in their mood. Uh, you may see um, the adolescent also warning signs, things that they might say or do. They might give away their most prized possessions. They might, um, they might say things like, well, I'm never going to be seeing you again, so this or that. Uh, sometimes the warning signs are a little subtle. One of the things we do know, though, adolescents that 
uh, lack strong relationships with others, are at higher risk as well. When they withdraw from relationships, sometimes this can be a warning sign. When we see any warning signs, we need to take it seriously and intervene. A lot of people are afraid to do that. They're afraid that if they take that up with the person, that somehow the person would be more likely to actually try to commit suicide. The evidence suggests exactly the opposite. If someone takes the time to talk with that person about it, often the suicide attempt can be averted. Uh, so if you happen to see any uh, in indication of suicidal ide ideation, you can ask the person. Now, of course, that's easier to do if you have a close relationship with them, but even if you don't know them well, you know, you can say things like, you say, hey, have you been thinking of harming yourself? And you know, surprisingly, a lot of people that are contemplating suicide, they will actually level with you and say, yeah, you know, I actually have been thinking about that. And then that opens the door for you to get them some help. So where you see anyone who's, uh, giving evidence of suicidal ideation, follow up, get them in touch, by the way, with a professional, you know, uh, clinical psychologist, uh, licensed professional counselor, licensed clinical social worker, psychiatrist, and so on, people who have the training and the tools to help that person, because we might think we're pretty good at helping them, but we're not professionals. We have not had the experience that these folks have we don't have the tools to get them in touch with those people immediately. And by the way, if you see anyone who is about to commit suicide or is engaged in that act, you just call 911. Okay, so don't wait around. Don't worry about what they're going to think. You need to intervene. Okay, um, just a little bit about medication and adult adolescent depression. Now, some adolescents may self-medicate. If they're feeling depressed, they might uh, experiment with various drugs to try to feel better, alcohol, maybe marijuana, things like that. Um, again, yes, I mentioned about um, the antidepressants uh, increasing suicidal ideation. Uh, so obviously, adolescents receiving those should be closely monitored. Um, untreated depression greater concern. So yes, if you have an adolescent who is depressed or seems to be, we need to again, get them in touch with a professional who can assess that and provide treatment. Okay. Uh, by the way, speaking of treatment, should mention treatment frequently fails to include less risky but empirically supported measures. So usually uh, if you take your adolescent to a medical doctor and it's determined the adolescent is depressed, doctor will prescribe an antidepressant and that's pretty much it and hope for the best. In fact, uh, we should know that, uh, that therapy, uh, psychotherapy, as I mentioned earlier, uh, can be very effective. Uh, but in many cases, that's simply not, uh, it's not provided, okay? Uh, also, we find that, uh, that support groups can be very helpful, okay? And then we have things that, interestingly, um, simply regular exercise, getting out in uh, outdoors, um, engaging in interactions with others, can be beneficial. Often the treatment fails to uh, utilize these very powerful behaviors. So do be aware that there is more that can be done than simply medication. Now, um, shifting now to dealing with strong feelings of anger and aggression. Um, again, we noted earlier, rejecting adult authority, acting out, uh, is that normal? No, it is not, okay? Uh, not completely rejecting adult authority, acting out. So um, most teenagers are law-abiding most of the time. Increased 
levels of anger during adolescence, though, are normal. Uh, this is very common. But steady aggression that occurs throughout adolescence, uh, childhood and adolescence, happens in about 7% of children and adolescents. That's a warning sign if this uh, aggressive behavior has been occurring uh, even previously. So one of the ways of dealing with strong feelings of anger is to break the law, uh, what we call juvenile delinquency, uh, law-breaking behavior under age 17. Now, it is true that most people will admit confidentially that they broke the law in some way, shape, or form before age 20. But usually the things that people have done were sort of minor things, like maybe taking a you know, pack of gum in the store or, uh, you know, maybe uh, engaging in drinking alcohol before they were legal age, that sort of thing. Uh, so most of that law-breaking behavior tends to be minor stuff. That said, serious um, infractions of the law, felonies and so on, only a small percentage of adolescents actually engage in that kind of behavior. Now, when adolescents do break the law, often they're not caught. And if they are caught, in many cases, they may not be necessarily arrested. And for example, we have a situation where maybe a police officer uh, comes by some adolescents who are sitting in the car drinking alcohol uh, late in the evening. And that uh, officer, in some cases, may use their discretion and decide rather than arresting all these adolescents that they're going to what? They're going to um, pour out the alcohol. They're going to uh, transport those adolescents to their homes uh, with their parents and so they don't get arrested. So you say, well, what's the point of that? In fact, consider that if those adolescents uh, are put under arrest, they're going to be uh, put into the juvenile justice system where they may actually encounter uh, more serious law-breaking adolescents. Uh, also, they now have a uh, arrest record, which then uh, can produce a sense of, I am a criminal. And of course, if you see yourself as a criminal, you're more likely to engage in criminal behavior. So often uh, law enforcement will resort to other ways of dealing with that other than arrests. Um, okay, so what are causes of adolescent law-breaking behavior? Um, we might look at some that have to do with brain function. We see this more likely occurring in people that have a very short attention span, uh, have hyperactivity, lack of emotional regulation, uh, delayed language development, uh, lower levels of intelligence, autistic characteristics, who experience, uh, who've experienced maybe malnutrition growing up, uh, prenatal maternal smoking, child abuse, brain damage, all these things uh, affect the developing brain and can contribute to logic behavior. Um, that said, in many cases, more prominent are psychological and social factors. For example, having a group of friends that are all engaged in breaking the law, um, especially if those are also older, more mature uh, kids, uh, that tends to influence adolescents. Also, if the adolescent is disengaged in school, uh, they don't see that as being very valuable. If they live in a crowded or violent neighborhood, uh, family unemployment, drug abuse, uh, or even drug abuse within their families, or have relatives that are incarcerated, all of those uh, environmental factors and social factors may contribute to law-breaking behavior. So we see two basic types of patterns, law-breaking behavior in adolescents, uh, we have the life course persistent offender. So this person engages in law-breaking behavior as an adolescent, continues to do so into adulthood. These are 
uh, more likely to have brain related deficits than the other pattern that I'm going to show you. That said, um, they you know, uh, may also be psychological and social factors as well. Uh, these individuals often have begun to break the law and have behavioral problems in childhood already. And they often are the first in their class to use drugs, have sex, or get arrested. We also have the uh, adolescence limited offender. So this individual engages in criminal activity as an adolescent, but as soon as they reach adult status, uh, 17, it's Texas here, I think, um, they simply uh, stop engaging in that behavior. <laughs> I had a friend some years ago that was telling about his experience as an adolescent. And uh, he and his friends used to go out and they used to steal cars when they were in adolescence. But he said, as soon as he reached adult age, they all quit. Uh, there's an example of adolescence offender. Now, adolescent offenders may have had some childhood behavior problems, but usually not so severe as those of life course offenders. And the adolescent, limited offender, often the law breaking is social, being a part of a group with friends and so on. Whereas the life course offender may engage in law breaking behavior uh, alone more frequently. Also the adolescent uh, limited offender must be protected against a number of things, which would be dropping out of school, drug abuse, uh, serving jail time, or uh, premature parenthood. All of these things may contribute to making this more of an ongoing pattern. There are some protective factors as well uh, that seem to enable that adolescent limited offender to stop offending. Uh, one would be simply two-parent family, uh, parental monitoring, avoidance of drugs, alcohol, being successful in school, also being female, it seems to be somewhat protective and having a uh, meaningful religious faith. So uh, there are some things that uh, can sort of counteract that tendency. So when it comes to uh, juvenile delinquency, delinquent behavior requires early intervention. There's a high level of victimization. So even with minor crimes, you know, somebody is paying for that. Incarceration and ignoring problems tends to backfire. Uh, we talked about some problems with incarceration. Ignoring the problem, obviously, it's not likely to go away on its own. In some cases, therapeutic foster care may be required. So what is that? Okay. Therapeutic foster care is placing the adolescent with a foster family that has special training. They then are able to help that adolescent with helping them to develop important life skills and also providing uh, consistent, effective discipline for them. So what they found is therapeutic foster care lowered subsequent arrest rates by 50%, pretty significant. Let me give you a scenario where that would be appropriate. Okay, this actually occurred when I was doing clinical work and we had an adolescent brought in, 13 year old uh, boy, and we needed to do a psychological evaluation. Uh, so as part of the interview process, uh, and uh, information that we already had, we knew that he had um, he had set uh, he was being raised by his grandparents, both of whom were in their seventies. The, he had set the uh, their grandparents his grandparents' house on fire with them inside. And luckily, they escaped. Uh, they didn't burn to death. He also had threatened to kill them numerous times and had stolen several thousand dollars from them. Um, where was his parents? Well, both of his parents were in prison. Um, the grandparents simply were not able 
in their elderly situation to provide the discipline he needed and keep up with them. Uh, so we had to recommend that he uh, be given therapeutic foster care and place with a family who could manage him and help him uh, alter his behavior. So I don't know what happened with him, but um, I think that probably that was beneficial. So there's the kind of scenario you would see. Uh, obviously, adolescents who engage in law-breaking behavior, supportive adult behavior, uh, relationships also are beneficial. Uh, where We can develop those relationships. We can have some influence. Helping that adolescent also to avoid antisocial peers, those who are engaging in law-breaking behavior also is important. So sometimes changing that person's environment uh, is necessary as well, their social environment. Okay, there you go. Now we're off to the last topic in the chapter, uh, drug use and abuse amongst adolescents. So we're gonna see some age differences, uh, drug use and abuse, because more widespread between age uh, 10 and 25, then begins dropping as people get into their 20s. If we wanna predict whether an adolescent uh, engages in drug use, uh, if we look at have they previously done so? That's our best predictor. We have many national differences in drug use patterns, um, even in nations that are right next to another, may have to do with differing laws and so forth. So differences then uh, in terms of cohorts, adolescents, um, drug use, has decreased in the U.S. since 1976. By the way, I graduated from high school in 1975 when actually the rates of drug use amongst adolescents were the highest. Um, adolescent culture may actually have greater effect on whether adolescents use drugs than laws do. Most adolescents in the U.S. have experience with drug use at some point. Uh, say that they could get access to illegal drugs if they wanted to. However, most adolescents in the U.S. are not regular uh, daily drug users, and uh, about 20% of them actually never use any drugs. The rates also vary from one state to another. Here you have a chart. Uh, this is some fairly recent data, even more recent than you have in your textbook that I looked up. And so you can see the uh, types of drugs percentage of high school seniors who use various drugs, uh, marijuana being most common, uh, also uh, various types of hallucinogens and so forth in terms of illegal drugs. Um, on the other hand, you'll notice that uh, there's a significant number of high school seniors who had uh, used prescription drugs or even out over the counter things like uh, amphetamines like Adderall, which is used for ADHD, um, sedatives, tranquilizers, and so forth. Um, so that gives you some sense of the um, percentages of drugs being used. Now, this doesn't include alcohol or tobacco, which are uh, highly common as well and would be up there with marijuana for sure. So we also see gender differences in drug use. Adolescent boys generally use higher amounts of drugs, use them more often than girls. Gender differences sometimes are reinforced by social constructions about what's proper for male and female behavior. So in some cultural groups, you're not thought of as really being a man unless you smoke. And so obviously that's gonna influence uh, people gender-wise. So in terms of harm that may come for, from drug use, uh, tobacco will find that it slows down growth as it impairs digestion, nutrition, and appetite just when that adolescent needs better nutrition uh, for rapid growth. Uh, also may contribute to deficiencies nutritionally, uh, can damage the developing heart, lungs, brains, and the reproductive systems of adolescents uh, with heavy use. In terms of alcohol, one of the most popularly used drugs amongst adolescents, um, heavy drinking can impair memory, self-control, 
Uh, this then may lead to uh, behaviors that are dangerous. Also, alcohol use in adolescence interferes with completed brain development. We know that prefrontal cortex of the brain that's so important for our control and decision making is not really completed till our mid 20s. Then we have the problems that alcohol uh, causes. So many adolescents, they might use alcohol uh, when they're having problems. So they can momentarily deny those problems and become less aware. But then as the alcohol wears off, the problem is still there, if not worse. And then, of course, you need more alcohol to continue to deny the problem and be less aware of it. Also with adolescents, denial that their alcohol use is a problem is pretty common. And so they may think, I'm okay, uh, I don't drink as much as somebody else or everybody else is doing this or that amongst the friends that they associate with. Uh, they may not even be aware of that they have a significant problem in some cases. Um, next, we have a look at um, in terms of marijuana. And here I'm going to say we're going to have to reevaluate uh, the extreme thinking on this. Uh, we tend to have people who go to one extreme or another and have some people who say, well, it's just, you know, terrible uh, for an adolescent. Um, on the other hand, you have some people say, oh, it seems to be pretty harmless. Uh, probably a middle ground makes more sense. One of the problems we have with this is we don't have a lot of good research because uh, since uh, this has been, for the most part, illegal here in the U.S., it's been very hard to do good research on it. And so we don't really know uh, a lot about how it affects the adolescent, uh, except for things that are just you know obvious. So, for example, we don't really know what effect it has on brain maturation that occurs during adolescence. Um, there is, uh, you know, some reason for concern that it might uh, have a negative impact on brain maturation at that point, since the brain is not completely mature yet. Um, we do know that marijuana does have um, some temporary effects on memory, language proficiency, logical thinking, motivation. So obviously, uh, if one is using it heavily, uh, this might interfere with um, education and so on, heavy use. And in fact, they actually found that regular heavy users, those that were using numerous times a day, were more likely to drop out of school, become teenage pregnant uh, parents, or uh, be uh, unemployed. So uh, having said that, again, you know, um, we don't know. It's correlational data. So we don't know if the marijuana use is the cause of the other problems or whether it may be the effect. You know, if you've dropped out of school, uh, you got nothing to do, well, uh, you might just turn to that for something to do. Uh, we don't know. Uh, or could there be a third factor? Could there be uh, maybe underlying depression, which uh, causes uh, dropping out of school, other uh, risky behaviors, as well as uh, experimenting with drugs. So it's real hard to sort this out. In fact, maybe it's all of those three in different situations. Uh, so that said, I'd say that uh, we do have to be concerned about the adolescent who uses this uh, frequently uh, or heavily and evaluate our some problems there that need attention. Um, occasional use of a drug. Um, drug use tends to be progressive with some drugs. Uh, in fact, first use of many drugs occurs as part of a social gathering. So many adolescents that try drugs don't become addicted to it, okay? Although, uh, again, the more frequent the use is, especially for drugs that produce physical uh, dependency, the more likely addiction is. Also, the younger the person is when they begin using the drug, the more likely they will produce, will uh, experience an addiction to the drug. So 
we might say, well, what can we do to prevent drug abuse amongst adolescents, harmful use of drugs? But one of the things that hasn't worked very well is for adults from the previous generation to tell their kids to not do that. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is what we call generational forgetting. The idea that each new generation forgets what the previous generation learned. So my generation where drug abuse was at its peak when I was going through high school, we can tell you all kinds of stories about bad things that happened to people in our class who maybe got hooked on this or that, or serious harm came to them when they're under the influence of some particular drug. I'll tell you all kinds of horror stories, but your generation may not benefit because you'll say, well, yeah, but that was then and this is now. Things are different now, and so we don't need to really listen to you. So uh, that has not been fully effective. So other programs, programs have been developed, uh, things like Program Project DARE, where you might have a police officer coming to school telling students to say no to drugs and try to highlight the dangers of drug abuse. But in fact, the statistics actually indicated that uh, DARE didn't really have that much impact on later drug use, uh, especially as years went by. So, They've also tried scare tactics, like some of the TV advertisements that uh, showed how uh, drug abuse might be damaging. But in fact, those often seem to backfire too. The advertisements made drug use then seem exciting to the adolescent as taking a risk. And Often were these exaggerated the dangers, adolescents recognized that and just simply made fun of them. Uh, the ads then gave some teenagers ideas about way to actually show their defiance of adults. Hadn't been particularly successful. In fact, advertising campaigns where there were anti-smoking announcements produced by cigarette companies uh, they found that those actually increase the rates of teen smoking rather than decreasing them. I guess yeah, if the uh, company that makes the cigarettes is so nice to put out a thing warning you, then they must be nice people and the product must be nice, I guess. So. Now, so what does seem to work where adolescents actually learn from their peers. So if their peers who have experienced problems due to drug abuse, confide in them, uh, they will tend to listen to that more. Also, where they can uh, hear this from trusted adults. So that means that, yes, we do need to develop close relationships with adolescents in our sphere of influence uh, so that we can talk to them about these things if need be. And also, adolescents uh, may be influenced by research. So adolescents can be influenced by uh, scientific research. So educating them about what that research has shown can be effective as well. So what we do know is continuing efforts are needed to help adolescents avoid the pitfalls of drug abuse. Um, we have to keep at it. Okay, so there you go. There is the chapter and Wow, I could have worn out pretty long, uh, all in one shot. So uh, at any rate, I'm gonna uh, close it off now. Make sure you use all of the other resources to review that, do your reading, uh, the resources I provided. We're gonna call that it.